question one. So it shows you the Krebs cycle and the reactions preceding it, preceding this before. Okay, so you've got the link reaction from pyruvate to acetylcholine in the Krebs cycle. So the question asks the student A, state precisely where the Krebs cycle occurs in the cell. So very straightforward, it should be in the matrix of mitochondrion. So let's check the answer. Hang on. Huh? I will post the mark scheme to you as well so that you can refer to it, okay? So the answer is the matrix of mitochondrion, mitochondria. Uh, okay, so strictly speaking, if I want to mark this question strictly, if you look at the question, it's in the cells. Where Krebs cycle occurs in cells, then the answer should be matrix of mitochondria. So if a student write matrix noma, mitochondria noma, matrix of mitochondrion noma, the only correct answer is matrix of mitochondria. So by this time, you know already, singular plural is very important for you to score the one mark. So please pay attention to every single word in the question. Okay? Right. B. Label on figure 1.1 1 .1 all the stages where decarboxylation and dehydrogenation reactions occur with a letter H. So for decarboxylation, it's very easy. As long as you see wherever the number of carbon changes from uh, three carbon, it drops to become two carbon. So this is where you can label this as X. So this is the first one. So altogether, there are three. So the next one you can see from 6C to 5C here. Also label this as X. And then from 5C to become 4C, uh, this one label X because decarboxylation means every time you remove one carbon. So altogether, there are three. Any one mistake will be minus one mark. Okay, so there should be three X, but every one mistake minus one mark. For dehydrogenation reaction is wherever uh, hydrogen acceptor accepts the hydrogen. So uh, quite a lot of students forgot about this one here. So you see, wherever NAD becomes reduced NAD, this is where dehydrogenation reaction occurs. I mean, hydrogen is removed from pyruvate and placed into the NAD. This is reduced. So two hydrogen is being, uh, hydrogen atoms being removed. So you need to put uh, XY here, right? Okay. So altogether, there are four. So one. So using this, very easy to identify. All right. Okay. Two here. And then three. And uh, this one also four, I think there are five. So altogether, there are five. So any one mistake minus one mark. Okay, next. Explain how NAD is regenerated. Three marks. How NAD is regenerated. So let's, let's look at this C. Yeah? So first, the reduced NAD, it will have to release its two hydrogen atoms to the electron transport chain. Okay, to the electron transport chain. Some students write the name of the reaction, oxidative phosphorylation, which is actually correct because it's through oxidative phosphorylation that N reduced NAD is oxidized to NAD. So this is accepted. So, when hydrogen is released to ETC, it will first be transported as hydrogen atoms. After that, it will split into H plus and then plus electron. And electron will continue to be uh, transported by the ETC. Whereas H plus will now be found in, my, in the matrix of mitochondrion. And eventually when the NAD will accept, hang on, what am I talking about? Reduce NAD, sorry, eventually it's the oxygen. Huh? Oxygen will accept electrons and also the proton. So the proton will also will come in here. So two electrons and two protons. Okay, the two electrons will come in here because the two H will be released per reduce NAD. Okay, so therefore H2O. So this is half. Huh? So this will become water. 
Okay. So therefore, eventually the hydrogen atom will be oxidized by oxygen. Oxidized. So this no no. They, they say reduce NAD is oxidized. Okay, reduce NAD releases hydrogen, so it's oxidized. Hydrogen released to ETC. So this is exactly where reduced NAD is oxidized. So that's why the answer is like this. They didn't actually give answer for oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, but I give mark because it's also correct. So you give to the nearest step. The best next step starting from reduced NAD is it has to release hydrogen to the ETC. Therefore, it is oxidized. So some students write a lot of things about electron transport chain, la, stock particle, la, proton pump, la, all these things got no marks. La. Okay, so focus on what the question wants and just give what the question wants. Okay, D. Question D. Okay, D is about rice plant. Let me make this bigger. Okay, rice plant is able to carry out aerobic respiration even though its roots is submerged in water. So the question asks the student, explain how rice is adapted to grow with its roots submerged. So the answer is based on the syllabus, whatever you've learned about this one. Six marks, six months, a lot of details have to be mentioned. Um, the answer to this question for majority of students are not full marks. Uh, it seems a lot of students did not study this topic Okay, so let's look at the mark scheme, the required answer. Many students didn't mention Aaron Kaima, which is the name of the tissue, a tissue where there are a lot of air spaces in the roots as well as in the stem. So I'm expecting a student to write Aaron Kaima. Strictly speaking, this word should be underlined. This word should be underlined. It means if you don't write Aaron Kaima, I will not give you mark. But some students describe that Oh, there are a lot of air spaces in the roots. Uh, that I give a mark if this is not underlined. If it's underlined, there'll be no mark. So I highly encourage you, whatever biological name that you've learned, write that name because one word is one mark. Then you want to describe what this name meant, then you can describe further. So there, are, there is Aaron Kaima in the root and stem. State very clearly. You see, root and stem is is one mark. So that's why a lot of students didn't get this mark because either they only talk about root, but they didn't talk about the stem. It must be a continuous aerian chyma so that the air from the leaf can then diffuse to the stem, then only to the root. So both stem and root must have aerian chyma. Okay? So that will help oxygen to diffuse into the roots where almost every student, I think 100% or 99% student didn't even mention this. Where is the oxygen supposed to come from? It's supposed to come from the leaf, then to the stem, then to the root. All students didn't mention about this. I think almost every student. If got mentioned, only one student mentioned. Okay. Uh, shallow root system. I'm quite surprised some students say that a lot extensive root system. Shallow. Because once it's submerged in water, Oxygen comes from, the, comes from the atmosphere. So it will have to first dissolve in the water, then diffuse into the water. So the deeper you go, the less is the oxygen. So therefore, the, there's no point that the root is very long because it cannot get enough oxygen. Okay? So therefore, the root is very shallow. Then, air foam trapped on underwater leaves. This one, no, we, didn't man, we didn't learn about this. So... I will ignore this one, okay? Because <clears throat> old syllabus, student learn more, learn a lot of details. New syllabus, not so much detail, okay? So skip this. Fast internal growth is that the plant will grow taller. So the moment the plant is submerged in water, it has to grow taller so that, you see, if this is a plant, okay? The young seedling, okay? The plant, and then the leaf, okay? The moment there's water, the plant will have to quickly grow taller so that there are parts that's exposed to the air to get enough oxygen and sunlight. So it have to grow taller. So very fast internode growth. Internode means the, 
the length between two adjacent leaves along the stem is called the internal. So the internal will grow faster. So when a plant grows taller, it's an internode length increases. Okay. Growth is regulated by gibberellina. This one is old. Uh, this one is gibberellin you learned before. Okay. Increase in length of the stem. Eating you didn't learn. So we ignore eating. Okay. So the plant will release plant growth regulator to promote growth in length. Then those parts that submerge in water can undergo anaerobic respiration. So anaerobic respiration produces ethanol, but the cells are tolerant to high ethanol concentration. So this one, maybe about 40% of students mentioned, okay, high ethanol concentration. And this one, very few students mentioned. Why high ethanol concentration is because the cell can produce this enzyme, ethanol dehydrogenase, Okay, to convert ethanol to ethanol. So it becomes non-toxic to the plant. So this is a very important information. AVP means any other valid point that's correct. Which nothing much to mention here. Okay. Any questions so far for all of you? No? Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Okay, so, so this one is thylakoid membrane. So figure 2.1 shows enrichment of photosystem protein complexes con so, uh, containing chlorophyll molecules on the thylakoid membrane of a chloroplast. So very interesting. Sites of photoactivation of chlorophyll, site of photolysis of water, Side of ATP synthesis. Ah, photolysis of water. Okay. So this black and white uh, and gray are photosystem, this electron transfer chain and ATPs. So we have got photosystem. This is photosystem two, electron transport chain, photosystem one, or it's the other way around. Photosystem two, electron transport chain, photosystem one, and then stock particles. So this is this is one whole set. Okay, this is one whole set that occurs together, followed by another set. Hey, hang on, where's my another set? Followed by another set, which is, hmm, how come very strange like this? The set seems a bit strange. Okay, so two photosystems will be together, electron transport in the center, followed by stock particle. So A, Describe the photoactivation of chlorophyll three marks. Describe the photoactivation of chlorophyll. So look at the answer. Chlorophyll, photoactivation of chlorophyll, I would prefer to start with number two. First, the light is being absorbed by the antenna complex or I'll accept light harvesting complex or light harvesting center or accessory pigments, or if you want to name the pigments, you have to name all the accessory pigments, which are carotenoids, chlorophyll B and chlorophyll A. So first, the light will be absorbed by the, the accessory pigments in the LHC, number one. Then number two, accessory pigments will then transfer this light energy from one accessory pigment to the next accessory pigment. So it's energy transfer. Transfer to where? transfer to the reaction centers, which can be P680 for photosystem two, P700 for photosystem one. Okay. And then this light energy, wherever it's being absorbed, it will excite the electron. It means the electron will go to a higher energy level. But the, the only pigment where electron can be lost is the chlorophyll A seated in P700 and P680, that's chlorophyll A. Okay, so then electron will be lost from the chlorophyll, which is also called the primary pigment. So this is what a student needs to describe. Okay, uh, number one is to me is irrelevant, right? Chlorophyll absorbs mainly red light and blue light, but it's also given a mark, lah. okay? 
next question is outline how ATP is formed in the chloroplast. How ATP is formed chloroplast? Three marks. Right, so let's look at the answer. Huh? First, the electron must flow along the ETC. And when the electron flow along the ETC, then proton will be pumped across the tylacoid membrane. You see, um, when I mark students' answer, a lot of students' answer are not complete. That means they were described halfway. Okay, for example, or oh, there's a flow of electron full stop. Where is it the electron flow? You need to mention along the ETC. Then it's complete. Then they say, oh, it result in pumping of proton. Then full stop. I cannot give mark. Pumping proton where? Across, at least you must tell me across telecord membrane. This is where a lot of students did not score for this marking point, even though they said, oh, electron is being, uh, proton is being pumped because they didn't say where exactly is being pumped. From where to where, through where. Remember in biology, wherever you say uh, something move, you must tell me from where to where, through where, by what process. So here you can say that, okay, electron is being, uh, proton is being pumped from the stroma to the tylacoid sp space through tylacoid membrane by uh, active transport. So that is called the full description in biology. Okay. Number three, because of pumping of proton, it leads to proton gradient being generated across the telecord membrane. So I have ignored this and put this as bracket. If I want to follow the mark scheme strictly, a lot of students will not get the mark because description is not complete. So in the actual exam, please try to describe fully because you already spent so much time studying, right? You know the fact, write it out so that examiner knows that you know. Very important, okay? Number four, flow of protons down concentration gradient through the ATP syn synthase or synthetase. Synthase is a short form for synthetase uh, or stock particle leading to ATP being formed from ATP and PI. This one, most students can score the mark because it's a full equation. And then last two are mentioning about there are two ways electron flow that can lead to ATP synthesis. First one is non-cyclic electron flow from PS2 to PS1. Second one is cyclic electron flow is from PS1 back to PS1 but passing through the ETC. Okay, these two. Okay, any question? No question, next. C, suggest an advantage of having photosystem the electron transport chain and ATP synthase as part of the tylacoid membrane. That means there are three components here. We need to have got photosystem, electron transport chain, and ETP, ATP synthase as part of the tylacoid membrane one mark. So if you have done past year, past year Maxim says efficient, but efficient C in what? So if you only write, oh, this efficient in photosynthesis, sorry, photosynthesis is form five level answer or form three level answer. In A level, you cannot give me a form five level answer. I cannot give you mark because not qualified. You need to give A level answer. So the moment you write photosynthesis, sorry, no mark because you have studied more detail than photosynthesis. So you expect to give an A level syllabus answer. Okay. So uh, I think about, one quarter students write efficiency in photosynthesis, so there's no mark. So let's look at what's the answer. The answer is increase in efficiency for what? For what? So you need to mention. So that there's a short diffusion distance or close together. Because all these, all these components are need to be close together for the for what purpose? for higher efficiency in light dependent reaction because all these three things needs to be there in order for light dependent reaction to occur. If you say efficiency in electron flow, electron flow is only 
involving photosystem and ETC full stop. Okay, efficiency in ATP syn synthesis. ATP synthesis, ATP synthesis is, is, is not complete because when all these three together, it allows light dependent reaction to occur. So it must be efficiency in absorbing the light by photosystem, efficiency in transfer of electron, and efficiency in creating the proton gradient, efficiency in ATP synthesis, all linked together. So the answer is efficiency in light dependent reaction. Okay. I also give mark for efficiency in ATP synthesis because you can see that ATP cannot be synthesized if there's no light being absorbed and there's no ETC. So I also accept ATP synthesis, even though I do not like this answer because it's not really um, complete. Lah. The complete answer is higher rate of light dependent reaction. Okay. Question three. Define the term excretion too much. So excretion is the removal of waste product. Waste product means unwanted products. Right? You already know that in a biochemical reaction, right? A plus B to form C plus D. So C plus D are all products. The moment the products are unwanted products, for example, CO2, right? CO2 from our res respiration is a product of respiration, but it's unwanted. So this unwanted product is considered as the waste. Unwanted products. So what do we do? Uh, where do they come from? It comes from metabolism. Okay. And why do we want to remove them? Because they are toxic. They affect our our cell activity because for example CO2 will reduce the pH okay reduce the pH of the cell reduce the pH of body so it will affect enzyme activity because enzyme activity depends on the optimum pH okay or the substance this product is in excess so we don't need it anymore so we have to remove them okay we can break it down and convert it to something else and re recycle them okay so B Outline the role of negative feedback in osmoregulation. <gasps> kidney regulate the water potential of body fluids. So kidney regulate the water potential of body fluids. So this one we have learned the regulation of water potential is actually carried out by two parts of the body, two parts of the kidney, right? Which is actually the um, PCT and collecting duct. Okay. Uh, sorry, DCT, and collecting duct. But in your syllabus, you only learn collecting duct. You do not learn DCT. DCT was all syllabus. So both DCT and collecting duct will play the role in uh, regulating the water potential of body fluids. Okay? And it says it involves a negative feedback. Involve a negative feedback means it's a homeostasis. So outline the role of negative feedback in osmoregulation. So what is it they want you to write? It is a homeostasis. So if it's a homeostasis, you will need to talk about, if you look at the mark scheme, it's actually talking about this homeostasis. Okay, homeostasis. Now let's recap homeostasis again. Homeostasis in our body involve, the principle of homeostasis involve the stimulus response model. Okay, so all of you know the stimulus response model already, right? Homeostasis is maintained by the stimulus response model. So when the question asks you to talk about the negative feedback in osmoregulation, that means they want you to talk about this stimulus response model because it is this model that contains a negative feedback. This is a model that, that represents homeostasis in our body. It's a principle. So therefore, how do you write your answer? Uh, is you have to apply this principle of homeostasis into the osmoregulation of water potential. So therefore, we start with what is the stimulus? Stimulus here is when it's low blood water content or low blood water potential because the question says water potential. So you follow the question. And then what is the receptor? So you say that the stimulus is low water potential. 
the receptor is osmoreceptor in hypothalamus. So once it receives this stimulus information, it's going to start to send, um, send messages to the coordinator. So osmoreceptor in the hypothalamus. So this hypothalamus, right? So it will then send electrical impulse along this neuron all the way to, now if you look at pituitary gland, pituitary gland got anterior and posterior. Okay, so the part that secretes ADH is posterior pituitary gland. So when a student only write pituitary gland, that means the answer is half correct and half wrong because anterior pituitary gland secrete estrogen, estrogen, uh, sorry, sorry, not estrogen, FSH and LH, and it will go to the reproductive organ in front. Posterior pituitary gland secrete ADH will go to kidney behind. So that's why it's important to mention which one. Remember, I write in, in the telegram, as I marked, I was very angry. So what comes out in anus is different from what comes out in a unit track, isn't it? What behind one in front is totally different. So you better mention which one is which one. Okay. So transmission by nerve to the coordinator, which is the posterior pituitary gland, which will lead to transmission again, the release of hormone ADH. And it's called neural secretion because the nerve cells secrete the hormone and then transported in the bloodstream. So this stimulus response model. And then where is the effector? Effector is DCT and collecting dark. And what happened to effector? It will increase in water permeability, increase in urea permeability in order to increase water reabsorption. So what I discover, almost half the students answer is only focusing on this part and did not mention about this whole thing, which the question is talking about because negative feedback is by stimulus response model. So let's look at the mask scheme. So this is done by homeostasis. So the stimulus is a change in the water potential. The receptor is the osmo receptor located in the hypothalamus leading to transmission. ADH is released in the posterior pituitary gland and then transported by the bloodstream. Effector is the collecting duct. I also accept DCT. The response via effector, means effector will carry out the response where the water will, will be reabsorbed and hence lastly, the water potential will return to, this is where a lot of students didn't learn up this word, huh? return to norm or the set point. Uh, quite a lot of students write, uh, become normal. Become normal is layman term, huh? okay? In biology, you need to use biological term, right? Water potential goes back to the norm, goes back to the set point, not normal. Normal is anybody you pull from the roadside, they say, ah, become normal. Lah. Okay, no need to sit for A-level exam. <laughs> okay, right, C. C is the name these two, um, name these two enzyme, huh? enzyme A and enzyme B. So this one has to do with glucose dipstick, right? So glucose dipstick have got two enzymes immobilized onto the strip. First one is glucose oxidase is to oxidize glucose to gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. Then the second <clears throat> enzyme is peroxidase because it wants to catalyze using H2O2 to oxidize the chromogen. So H2O2 will oxidize the chromogen. So the chromogen has H2 removed and it change color. Okay, so the second one is peroxidase. So this one is, you just have to memorize. Uh, okay. Number four. Ah, so this is what? Neurons. Uh. A, describe the function of myelin sheath. Uh, most students get this correct. So let's look at the answer. Myelin sheath 
act as an insulator so that um still uh some students don't get the don't get the marks even though it looks like the answer is correct uh. so let's see what you need to write to score uh. action potential cannot fire in the part of the axon that's covered by myelin sheath action potential can only fire at the node of Ranvier. The reason is because the part of axon that is covered by the myelin sheath here, it doesn't allow sodium and potassium to pass across the membrane. So this entire region here has no charge at all because the, the charges cannot pass across the membrane. So no charge difference can be built. So only the region that's not covered by myelin sheath, which is a node of Ranvier, that sodium potassium ions can pass through and therefore can create a resting potential or depolarization or action potential. So action potential can only fire in the node of Ranvier. And hence, it will jump from node to node, which is called saltatory conduction or saltation. Or the local circuit is between one node of Ranvier to the adjacent node of Ranvier. So it's called the local circuit. Yeah, so here, the local circuit is long. Uh, it's not short. Okay, It's long. This is from this point to this point. Without node of Ranvier, it will be short. It's to the adjacent point. Okay, So that will speed up the impulse transmission. Okay, Next question. Suggest how the intensity of stimulus can be passed along a single nerve cell. That means intensity of stimulus means, um, let's say for example, touching the skin versus punching the skin versus cutting the skin. The sensation is different, right? But you are using the, the same neuron to transmit. So how will it tell our brain that the sensation is stronger and stronger, stimulus is stronger and stronger? Then of course, um, you have to use intensity of stimulus is by frequency. Frequency of the uh, electrical potential. Okay. Now C. C is to label different different parts. So as long as you have studied, then you will know how to label Q as well as P. So let's recap the Q and P using the PowerPoint slides, right? Okay. So in a sarcomere, sarc means flesh. Mere means part. So a small part in our flesh means our muscle. This is a unit of uh, a unit of muscle contraction. Okay? One whole unit must work together. So we have got A band is the entire length of the uh, myosin. And then H band is a region where it doesn't overlap with the um, actin and an I band is the region that is only spared with actin only and then we've got two discs right M line which is actually a disc is the middle line M line then Z line are those lines at the side of one sarcomere okay so please remember this one huh? so the answer for Q is where's my Q huh? Q is A band because it stretches the entire length of the thick filament. It overlaps with the thin filament, so it's A. A means overlapping. So when you write the A, this one will overlap with this one. So the entire region that overlaps is A. Okay, this line, when you draw up, will overlap. So the overlapping region. Then what else do we have? P is the Z line or the Z-disc. Interesting, huh? you see the Mark Skins give the actual full name of the Z, which is Russian Shabir. I don't know what is this language. Okay. Which is really true, but this such word. Huh? Okay. Right, D. Okay, D. What is D? Huh? Describe the role of calcium ions in the shortening of sarcomere. So, uh, in this answer, I expect you to start to write about calcium ions, five marks. Okay, so 
start from calcium ion. Don't, don't tell me any other thing before calcium ion because there's no mark there. So let's look at the mark scheme. Huh? Calcium ions, okay, or Ca2 plus ions from sarcoplasmic reticulum. You see, they say they reject or if your charge is wrong, you see, if the charge is wrong, reject one time. Okay. Bind to troponin. Troponin changes shape. Tropomyosin. This is the part where students' answer is very vague. That means not clear. Lah. Okay. The students say, oh, uh, troponin will move. I think that's what the students say. Troponin will move. No. Troponin changes shape and tropomyosin move. Huh? Exposing the binding site on actin, myosin head binds, myosin head tube, actin being pulled. So let's look at the diagram to describe this part. Here. This one. Okay, so start from here. So, you see carefully here, this is the thick filament and this is thin filament. So thick filament is myosin, thin filament is actin. And a large version of thick filament, uh, sorry, thin filament is made of two chains of actin molecules, right? Actin molecule, two chains of them. And then we've got this tropomyosin and troponin. Tropomyosin is fibrous. Troponin looks like globular. So calcium will bind to troponin and because this is a globular protein, it, it portrays the feature of um, allosteric property, right? Allosteric property. Allosteric. So all globular protein where something can bind to it will have got this property. Allosteric. Allo means other. Other. Steric means structure. That means when something binds to it, because it needs to hold that structure. So it will change shape. Okay, it will change shape. So which is the one that changes shape is troponin will change shape. So when troponin changes shape, because tropomyosin attached to it, it will also move. It will not change shape. Ah. It moves. Ah. So the one that changes shape is troponin. Now, if you move from point A to point B, don't tell me you change shape. Ah. Don't tell me your body, right? Your body now is this shape. When you start to move to the other side, you change shape, man. You didn't change shape, right? You got the same shape. It's just that you move. So move and change shape are two different uh, descriptions. So you need to use the word carefully. That's why I'm very strict in marking this. The moment you say tropomyosin change shape, I will not give you mark. It didn't change shape. It just moved. The one that changes shape and therefore it moves is troponin because when it changes shape, it actually moves. Okay? So please write accurately your answer to score the marks. Okay? So, certain description in the textbook was not very accurate, so I choose the accurate description. I think I read the textbook says troponin move or tropomyosin move, whatever. Sorry, no, no, no. Troponin changes shape, tropomyosin move. Okay? I'm very strict with that clarity of description. Right? If you want to score full marks, you have to choose the best description. Yes, change in shape of tropomyosin causes displacement of tropomyosin, correct, Adam? That's correct, okay? Yes, correct. So therefore, let's look at this one. Huh? What's this recovery day? Okay, here. Huh? So step one, the calcium will come to attach to tropom tropomyosin. Myosin, huh? myosin is globular. So it will attach, sorry, sorry, what, what I'm talking about, sorry. It will attach to tropomyo, tropo, troponin. Now, myosin is like muscle, so it's fibrous, okay? Myosin is like a muscle, it's fibrous. So troponin is the globular. So attached to troponin, troponin changes shape, tropomyosin will move away together with troponin to expose the binding site. So the myosin head will bind to its binding site when it binds to its binding site, where am I? Here. See? It will bind 
okay, to its binding site here. So when it binds, what happened? Now, this is where some students did not give a very accurate answer. Now, when it binds, a power stroke will happen. That means the head will tilt towards the M line, the middle line, because you want to pull this myosin towards the M line. So the myosin head will tilt, tilt towards the M line, and this is called the power stroke. Okay, this is called the power stroke. Now, at that time, what happened is that ADP will detach from the head. Now, this is a part where students write wrongly. They say, oh, ATP will be uh, uh, hydrolyzed. No, ADP already hydrolyzed already. Already hydrolyzed. Okay, you see uh, what happened here. Now, let's look at recovery part. So, once the head is tilted, it will remain tilted unless ATP comes and remove it. So, you see, this is tilted head, right? ATP must bind to the tilted head, which is the myosin head, so that the myosin head will detach from the actin. And then after that, ATP will be hydrolyzed already. So it's already hydrolyzed here. So when it's hydrolyzed, it will become ADP and PI attached to the head already. So once ATP is hydrolyzed, the energy released is used to bring the head to stand up again. That means tilt away from the end line. So it's already stand up. So at this stage here, ATP already hydrolyzed. So some students say that, say that uh, at this stage is where ATP is hydrolyzed. No, it's already hydrolyzed. At this stage, the, the ADP and PI will detach from the head when the head attaches to the binding site at the actin chain. You just imagine your hand is holding one thing. If you want to go and hold another thing, you have to release it. So originally it's holding ADP and PI. So now the head wants to attach to here. So you have to release this tool. So as it attach to that, it will release this tool. Okay. So learn up the sequence if you're not familiar with the sequence. Because sequence is something that's easiest to score in the exam. Easiest because no need to think one, just write only. Okay. Certain question you need to think. The one is more challenging. The one you have to depend on causes and condition. That means your luck. They can say your luck. Okay. But this one, you definitely can score one. So learn out all of them. Okay. Right. Next question. Where's my next question? Where's my question paper? <laughs> Where's my question paper? Here. Okay. Next. Right. Ah, so there's a snake here. Ah. What they ask. The venom from the many banded crate contains bungaro toxin. In mammals that are bitten by this snake, the venom acts as, at the neuromuscular junction. So the venom acts at, at the neuromuscular junction, causing the muscle paralysis. Now, neuromuscular junction means to it, it involves the The presynaptic neuron, right? This is okay. This is presynaptic neuron. This is a synapse. And this synapse is attached to the muscle, uh, the muscle cell. Okay. So they want you to talk about this whole region here. Because this is the neuromuscular junction, this whole thing. Okay. What happened to this? that cause muscle paralysis. So they say that when this toxin uh, is injected by the uh, snake into the body, it will affect the neuromuscular junction and that will cause muscle paralysis. That means the muscle cannot contract anymore, cannot function. So suggest how bungalow toxin may cause muscle paralysis. So you need to give me answer for this entire region. That's what the masking is all about. Okay, so let's look at the mask skin. So first we start from the presynaptic neuron. So the toxin can cause a reduce in the release of acetylcholine or neurotransmitter by the presynaptic neuron. So the, the toxin can work in many ways, right? So for every step, 
you can mention this step cannot happen, this step cannot happen, this step cannot happen. So every step you mentioned. So every step is where this toxin might intervene, might inhibit that particular step or that particular process. Okay? So, so step number one, it may reduce or prevent release of acetylcholine. Step number two, it may prevent the binding of acetylcholine to the postsynaptic membrane, which is called the sarcolemma, which because this is a muscle cell. And therefore, there'll be no depolarization. I also accept students say, oh, there'll be no action potential. Uh, ignore impulses, at least unless you write electrical impulses. Okay. Number four, it may also bind to the receptor on the post synaptic membrane. So this is where you need to describe very clearly. Where does it bind to? It binds to receptor. Where? post synaptic membrane or sarcolemma. Oh, okay. So it may compete with... Where is it? Mm. Prevent acetylcholine from binding. So it competes with acetylcholine or prevent acetylcholine from binding because this receptor, which is found in the sodium ion channel, right, in the sarcolemma, has got a binding site for acetylcholine. So it can compete with acetylcholine. So it binds to here, then acetylcholine cannot bind. Okay. So therefore, inhibit depolarization of post membrane, uh, or it can inhibit the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. So there's an enzyme that will break down this one so that this can be removed. So it may actually uh, bind to that enzyme and inhibit the enzyme to break down acetylcholine. Okay, so acetylcholine cannot be broken down. So Permanent depolarization of post membrane. I think this is where uh, a lot of students didn't mention about this. Uh. You see, if acetylcholine permanently attached to the receptor, now what happened, you remember or not, membrane, the neuron cannot fire continuously one because for the graph that you have learned, remember or not, first, there will be a resting potential. So this is membrane potential. Eh? This is time. This is membrane potential. Potential in millivolts. Okay, so initially is negative 70 millivolt, right? Resting potential. So first, there must be stimulus to initiate depolarization. Second, depolarization must be above the threshold potential. I think it's negative 20 something millivolt. And then only action potential is generated. So when action potential is generated, then only the action potential from one point can be passed to the neighboring point when there's action potential. But don't forget, this action potential, once it's reached, it has to go down to repolarization. So this is depolarization, right? This is depolarization. And then it has to go down to repolarization. So this is a cyclic process, right? Then after that, it will go to this part here is called hyperpolarization, right? This part here. Hey, what am I drawing? Okay. Then after that, sorry, it must go straight down. This one I don't have. This has resting potential, okay? Resting potential. So this is a process that occurs in a cycle. So if the acetylcholine attaches to here and is not removed, what happens is that once an action potential is fired, of course, the membrane will come back to rest. The moment it comes back to rest, which is at this point, again, it can be stimulated. So remember, this whole thing is called the refractory period. I think this is very important that you know, just in case they ask you an exam, a refractory, refractory period. So remember, refractory period is the period of time that will have to lapse. 
when a neuron receives a stimulus until it's able to respond to the next stimulus. So the period of time after it receives a stimulus until the time where it can react to another stimulus. So stimulus comes in here, right? Sorry, uh, I think this is, this is where stimulus comes in here. So this will be here. Okay, this one don't have. So from the time it receives a first stimulus until the next point where it can respond to the stimulus, this is the refractory period where I think a lot of time we, we have actually mistaken that this is the refractory period, it's called recovery period. But in biology, you want to do well, you have to first check what is the definition of this word refractory period. We cannot just assume or recovering. Where is it recovering? The definition of refractory period is the time where it receives a stimulus until it can respond to another stimulus. Means this whole stretch is the refractory period, not only during uh, repolarization and hyperpolarization. So therefore, you want to do well in biology, you need to learn up the definition. Means specific, clear, precise, concise, accurate, crystal clear. Okay. So when this is not removed, this membrane will fire and action potential after it come back to rest and all. Once it come back to rest, because this is still there, the sodium will still come in. Sodium ion still come in. So therefore, the membrane will still depolarize. So there's still a stimulus. It will fire another action potential and then come to rest and fire another one, come to rest, fire another one. So continuously firing the action potential. Continuously. Continuously fire the action potential. So if you say continuously fire action potential, that means the muscle must keep on contracting, but correct not. But the thing is, if the muscle keep on contracting, there'll be not enough ATP, there's not enough oxygen anymore to supply to the continuous uh, 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 contraction of the muscle. Means muscle contract, release, contract, release, contract, release all the time, then it will paralyze already. It will paralyze because not enough ATP, not enough oxygen. Okay, if you keep on working, don't you think that you become tired? Your muscle also become tired. Means there's not enough oxygen for me to produce enough ATP for muscle contraction because I'm going to anaerobic respiration. I need to rest. Okay. Right. Okay, so I will stop here because it's already 8.56. We will continue the discussion in uh, tomorrow. Is that okay?